السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على إخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا إن الشيطان للإنسان عدو مبين وكذلك يجتبيك ربك ويعلمك من تأويل الأحاديث ويتم نعمته عليك وعلى آل يعقوب كما أتمها كما أتمها على أبويك من قبل إبراهيم وإسحاق إن ربك عليم حكيم لقد كان في يوسف وإخوته آيات للسائلين بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah And may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam And His family and His companions and all those who tread His path We ask Allah Azza wa Jal in this final hour of Jumu'ah, this blessed hour This hour of response of dua for Allah to make us and you of the carriers of His book And of those shielded and shaded by His book and those transformed as worthy of his pleasure or into being worthy of his pleasure by virtue of our dedication and our commitment to his book Allahumma Ameen May Allah Azza wa Jal make this Quran a, a means for us to accelerate towards his paradise and his company forever and may Allah Azza wa Jal protect us from being of those who place the Quran behind our backs and as a result are driven by it into the fire or driven because of it into destruction Allahumma Ameen so we welcome everyone back to our discussions and our reflections on Surah Yusuf, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam in the 12th chapter of the Qur'an. And we concluded last week at the verse wherein Allah Azza wa Jal said that Ya'qub alayhi salam, the father, responded to his son Yusuf and said, O oh my dear son, do not relate this dream of yours that is foretelling your glory, your coming greatness to your brothers, فَيَكِيدُوا لَكَ كَيْدَ because they may plot against you. In الشَّيْطَانَ الْإِنسَانِ عَدُوُّ مُبِينَ Because the shaitan is a clear enemy to the human being. And of course, if shaitan is invisible, then how can he be a clear enemy? Uh, that would be a misunderstanding as to what a clear enemy refers to throughout the Qur'an. A clear meaning, make no mistake about it. He will forever be your enemy. He will never consider or back down from, he's your permanent enemy. He's your staunchest enemy. He will not go away. He will not be negotiated with. He will not sympathize. He is as clear as they get in his enmity to you, towards you. And also, you know, this is very uh, intelligent and wise of Yaqub alayhi salam. Uh, before we move on to today's ayat, something we didn't cover last week is that he tied the plotting that may happen by the brothers with shaitan. This is obviously not acquitting the brothers of any wrongdoing they may do. In fact, he's warning him against his brothers. But it's also reminding him that there's an overlap. The human being is not shaitan, but he's just so susceptible to shaitan. And so that could help us many a times when we have like some confusion as to how to understand a person could be so evil. Or sometimes our kids also. Uh, you don't know how to explain to them that this close friend of ours or this relative of ours performs an open haram in their language, in their behavior, in their decisions, whatever it is. And so this is a great advice from Yaqub alayhi salam. You can say to your kids or even say to yourself when you're like, how can I ever forgive this person for that evil deed? Tell yourself, you know what? Shaitan tricked him in that. The same way he tricks us in so many other things. And so when we make dua for ourselves to be protected from shaitan, let's make dua for this person as well. Maybe that was the help that, Yaqub, that Yusuf alayhi salam needed, uh, that subtle help that helped him forgive his brothers at the end of the story, as you all know. Uh, the fact that he realized that they were, uh, in a sense, though not acquitted of, of guilt or of you know, wrongdoing, but in a sense, uh, duped by shaitan into uh, accepting that for themselves. 
And then the next ayat, the ayat we will begin with today, Allah Azza wa Jal continues the statement of Yaqub alayhi salam that he says to his son, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ And it, so will your Lord choose you. And ijtiba in the Qur'an, some scholars said, only refers to prophethood. Not just choose you to be righteous or choose you to be special. Ijtiba only came, as some of the scholars said, with regards to prophethood. Meaning he will choose you, O Yusuf, as a prophet. وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ And teach you the interpretation of ahadith, statements, dreams, events. We'll come back to it, inshallah, because it has the potential for all of these things. Uh, these are the dangers of uh, speaking in the outdoors. Your notes can fly away. وَيُتِمُّ uh, نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ And perfect his favor upon you. وَعَلَىٰ آلِ يَعْقُوبُ And upon the descendants of Jacob, your descendants and mine, كَمَا أَتَمَّهَا Just as he perfected it in the past upon your forefathers, Abraham and Isaac, Ibrahim and Ishaq, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Your Lord is all-knowing, all-wise. So, <clears throat> think about that. There is a plot, but realize that your Lord has chosen you for something very special, the very special rank of prophethood. From all your brothers, He has chosen you. Uh, though there is some discussion that the, the other brothers were chosen as prophets, but uh, as Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says, it's extremely far-fetched to believe that even before prophethood, uh, an individual that would become a prophet could perform the acts that the brothers of Joseph performed in the story that we will uh, cover. Uh, and so, uh, he has chosen you, and in front of, they will plot against you. And you know, Dr. Ali Al-Fifi mentioned something very beautiful that everyone can plot, but when Allah chooses, uh, then all of the plotting becomes irrelevant. All of the planning becomes irrelevant. And so when Allah selects a person, for example, to become distinguished, the most thorough uh, plans, the, the most vicious storms, uh, the, the best enemy tactics, they become child's play. They become a breeze. They become a walk in the park. And the darkest, most sinister uh, plans, they become daylight. They, just, they don't phase or harm in the least. And then he said, oh, your Lord will uh, choose you. And he said, teach you ta'weel al-ahadith. Ta'weel means interpretation. And it could also mean the outcome. Uh, ahadith, like hadith of the Prophet ﷺ means his statement and otherwise, uh, or includes his statement at least. Ahadith is the plural of hadith. It means statements, the interpretation of statements. Ru'a are dreams. Uh, the dreams here are called statements. Uh, why? Perhaps of the wisdom and of the lesson in that is that people always talk about their dreams. It's just part and parcel of human nature. We just cling to our dreams. Uh, and I don't want to get into the potential psychology of that. That's, uh, not my, uh, that's above my pay grade. That's not my specialization. That belongs to my sister. She's the psych major. Um, but there are some reflections here about human patterns. But that's not what we want. What we want is considering these are human patterns. Let's just get past that point. We should tolerate people and something that's just naturally embedded inside them. People forever, for as long as human beings have been around, like to talk about their dreams. And so we should let them. Whenever they're not obsessing over them or making too much out of them or you know, overly relying on them, let people speak about their dreams. Don't be that person that interprets without qualification, but also don't be that person that shuts people down when they want to talk about something that means something to them. The Prophet ﷺ himself would ask people after, after Salat al-Fajr, has any of you seen a dream? And so this is something that uh, even I struggle with. Not to say even I, but uh, it is just ironic or unfortunate. The one sharing the words uh, always gets stuck on, on the words that need to be said for the greater benefit, but are awkward in being said by someone who doesn't live up to them. Uh, I struggle with letting people uh, uh, say their dreams in front of me. <laughs> I have to really hold myself. Why? Because most people or a lot of people, they, uh, they put too much in dreams. And so I, my go-to now is just, and that's wrong, is just to almost roll my eyes, say, here we go again, or when, when the dreams come. But at the end of the day, Allah did give us Qur'an, He did give us Sunnah, He did give us wise people with real life experiences, He did give us istikhara prayer, He did give us experts to consult, and so we should not be dismissive of all of that. That's all I want to say. Do not be dismissive of all of that uh, just because of a dream that we can't shake off. But we should still let you say your dream <laughs> whenever you're not being obsessive or misusing of that dream. Uh, also, you know, it's possible that 
we can take from this in the science of dream interpretation that when people have vivid dreams as children, they may become a person of greater skill, greater aptitude to interpret dreams uh, when they're older. They have greater potential for specializing in that. The same way you can notice this kid will be a good engineer, that kid will be a good you know, a legal scholar or, so, or whatnot, or physician. This person could be skilled at having that heightened sense of making sense of the dreams, especially when it requires a sixth sense of sorts. It has principles, by the way, but you also have to read a little bit into the personality of the person. Two people could have the exact same dream, and it could mean two very different things because it is a little bit uh, variant based on the person that saw it. And so perhaps this is of the signs of being skilled at dream interpretation when you have vivid dreams early. Where do we get that from? From Yaqub salam telling his son, <coughs> your Lord is going to teach you the interpretation of dreams. وَيُتِمُّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ And perfect his favor upon you uh, and upon the descendants of Jacob. You know, everyone seeks God's favor. This is a very important lesson. But to seek the perfection of God's favor uh, is something that those best acquainted with Allah know that they should do. What is the perfection of Allah's favor? I mean, for sure, the, the most perfect favor from Allah is to be most perfectly guided and to be a prophet. But none of us are going to be prophets after the Prophet wasallam sealed prophethood. And so the perfection of favor is for us to be benefited by whatever things we enjoy, whatever secondary favors, we'll call them, or relative favors, the favors of life and health and wealth and friends and intellect and these favors to be perfected for you is for them to be a means of you coming close to Allah because every single favor is imperfect it could benefit you it could harm you but the perfect favor is the favor that brings you close to Allah that's the true favor that's the absolute favor and that is why when you say sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim al fatiha give me grant me the path of those you favored what is the, who are those you favored? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim Guidance to the straight path. And so that's why Ibn Taymiyyah said, in reality, whatever brings you any blessing that brings you closer to Allah, any hardship that brings you closer to Allah is a, is a favor from Him uh, and a gift and a blessing. And every blessing, right, what we ordinarily at face value consider a blessing that brings you far from Allah, that is a disaster. That's a calamity. And then he said, perfect his favor upon you and upon the descendants of Jacob the same way he perfected it on those before you. To always feel like you didn't fall off of a tree or come out of nowhere is extremely important for us uh, to be humbled also and to be optimistic that we are the extension of, we could be the product of someone's dua, a parent or a great-great-grandparent whose name we don't even know a dua that left their lips in the middle of the night in their sujood or otherwise. Uh, Yusuf alayhi salam is the most noble, the son of the most noble, the son of the most noble, the son of the most noble. As the Prophet sallallahu said, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Maybe he is the product. Maybe had Ibrahim alayhi salam not made that dua, uh, Allah would not have uh, blessed his descendants uh, in such a beautiful consecutive way. And so that is very humbling. That it may not be me that much at all, as much as I think. I am, uh, you know, uh, eating on the tab of, if you will, uh, a far more righteous person than myself, that, that I am just one of his barakat, one of his blessings. And likewise, you become optimistic that many things go wrong, but there are hidden factors helping you along your path that you may not realize. Just as he perfected his favor upon those before you, uh, Ibrahim and Ishaq. And then the father ended by saying, Inna Rabbaka Alimun Hakim. Your Lord is all knowing, all wise. You know, nothing, even statistically speaking, nothing uh, ensures the transmission of faith to your children uh, like the influence of the parents, even if the parents may not realize it. You know, they, they blossom in the direction of the parents more often than anything else, even if it takes a while, even if they blossom late. And so, the best influence or the strongest influence will be that of the parents. And so the best influence the parents can offer their child is to instill in them unwavering trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, before you are plucked from their life, O oh parents, or before the, they are plucked from your life, the children, and, you know, life takes its course, whatever that means, in, a, you know, countless ways, 
make sure you carve into their personality, into their depths, into their soul, and then rest assured, they'll be fine once they know who Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, inna rabbaka, you just need to know that Allah is knowing wise. That's it. Why we say rest assured, because you don't know exactly what else you should rely on besides Allah. You can't rely on the fact that my life will take a certain course. You can't. They say hindsight is twenty twenty. When you look back, you say, oh, those disasters weren't so bad. And so Allah knew, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, how important it was for Yusuf alayhi salam to see the glory of his dream, uh, to see his glory through that dream, so to stay positive when the, when the vicious events uh, erupted. And so he helped him along, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may not have been at the moment what we would think is the best uh, you know, course of action, but uh, Yusuf alayhi salam was taught, alhamdulillah, yani, to think even that Yusuf alayhi salam was not taken away from his father until his father had the opportunity to instill these values in him. That's of the, the great knowledge and wisdom and care of Allah for Yusuf alayhi salam. And so Allah showed him this and his father kept reinforcing in him, your Lord is knowing wise. And so that stuck with him throughout the process. You know, you could you think of it may be, you know, that we might think, like hindsight is twenty twenty, right? We might think before the events that it would have been better for Yusuf alayhi salam to know what's gonna happen to him, like to just brace himself. But that's actually not wisdom at all. Uh, because many times we hurt ourselves more obsessing or being anxious over something harmful, right? That may or may not happen actually, right? More than the actual harm itself far more damaging, far more disrupting of our peace of mind. And so of Allah's wisdom subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He showed him the outcome of the events and He knew before the outcome came that Allah is alimun hakim so that He could await the outcome. The last ayah we will cover very quickly. Uh, we recited in the beginning, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتٌ لِلسَّائِلِينَ There is certainly in the story of Yusuf and his brothers lessons for all those who ask. What does that mean? I mean, first of all, ayat means signs. Signs means lessons and proofs and indications that need to be pointed out. So Ibn Ashur, rahimahullah, he says about this ayah and his tafsir that the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, it contains signs for many things. Many signs. Because it is said in the plural, right? And so signs that signify the necessity of being patient and being pure uh, en route to good outcomes. Things take a while. Uh, but in the grander scheme of things, it's just a moment. And also how envy and malice, even where you least expect it, is usually the case behind the details of why there's animosity between people. You may think it's because of this or it's because of that, but at the end of the day, the underlying factor that we should keep in mind is this envy and this malice that lurks in human beings. And of it is also signs, in the story signs of the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, it becomes beyond question after he brought to the expert scholars of the Judeo-Christian scriptures the story of, the lost knowledge of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam in this story. And also, you know, Alaykum as salam wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Kif halak? Muslims in the park, mashallah. Uh, it says in the story of Yusuf and his brothers is uh, a lesson. A lesson also for, uh, for those, a sign for those that are wondering if they can ever forgive. It's his brothers. The most difficult emotional wounds are those that come from the directions you least expect. And so, you know, like your own flesh and blood. And so, through the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, we are reminded that even those, the most difficult wounds, emotional wounds, can be overcome. And so, like, you're struggling to forgive and forget. Remember the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. In that is a sign for you. Have they done to me what Yusuf's brothers did to him? Uh, that's something Sheikh Dr. Salah Hassawi, hafizahullah, uh, once brought to our attention and because he was the one feeling uh, attacked by those he least expected, it, it was very beautiful coming from him. At the end of the day, he just takes a deep breath and he says, you know what, what, what have they really done to me? Have they done to me what the brothers of Yusuf have done to him? You know, may Allah forgive us and them. I'm a test for them, whether they'll wrong me or not, and they're a test for me. It's just very beautiful of him. The last thing I'll say about ayatun lisa'ilin, it is signs for those who ask. You gotta be looking for it. 
those inquiring about it. You know the concept of cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance means basically a mental disconnect, to deliberately let yourself disconnect. Yeah, that's actually the problem with stories, that you don't ask, why, I, why do I feel this way? Or, or uh, what is in this story of a lesson for me? You just get absorbed in the story, and you just ride the story, and you, you don't ask. Uh, and so to push yourself to be thoughtful and to reflect in order to, to benefit from the lessons that come your way, uh, you cannot let yourself just get sucked into any story and just listen to it passively. Uh, you'll miss out on so much. Allah wants you to be inquisitive, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, perhaps that's of the wisdom why the stories of the Qur'an are... Uh, what's the word? Scattered is not the word I'm looking for. But you know, the story of Musa alayhi salam is distributed all over the Qur'an. The story of most prophets, not Yusuf alayhi salam, but almost all the prophets, distributed throughout the Qur'an. Why? Maybe it's so that you can dive into the story, take the lesson and come back out. But if the story just remains a story, you'll just get sucked in and live the moment and you will not benefit as much. That's probably why, or one of the wisdoms why, usually the stories of the Qur'an are like that. And Allah knows best. And Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, they uh, asked him actually, and he is Turjuman al-Qur'an, right? The master interpreter of the Qur'an among the Sahaba and of course everyone after them. They asked him, how did you develop all this knowledge? Like all this deep understanding of the Qur'an, where did you get it from? He mentioned two things. He said, بِلِسَانٍ سَأُولٍ وَقَلْبٍ عَقُولٍ He said, with an inquisitive tongue, I'm always asking questions, وَقَلْبٍ عَقُولٍ and a receptive heart. And so in the story of Yusuf and his brothers uh, are signs for those that have a receptive heart, those that are inquisitive, those that are inquiring, those that are receptive. May Allah make us and you of them. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khair everybody. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum.